Um, hi, my name is Clark Packard. I'm a resident fellow and trade policy counsel at the R Street Institute. Uh, today, R Street releases a paper uh, policy brief entitled Resisting Protection Protectionism in the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain. Uh, in recent months, policymakers in Congress and the Trump administration have focused on pharmaceutical supply chains. Uh, like virtually all modern products, pharmaceuticals are the result of globally complex supply chains with production taking place in numerous countries. An individual drug may cross several borders uh, during the production process and the manufacturing process with the active pharmaceutical ingredient or API uh, originating elsewhere but final assembly in the United States. The Commerce Department recently noted large, diversified, and global. The U.S. pharmaceutical industry is one of the most critical and competitive sectors in the economy. Indeed, the United States is the largest importer of finished drugs, and, but because drugs made in, most drugs made in the world are not consumed in the United States, the U.S. is also a major exporter. Between 2002 and 2018, the value of pharmaceutical exports tripled and now account for about $50 billion a year. The U.S. Department of, or the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that approximately 300,000 Americans work in the pharmaceutical industry with a median average wage, uh, about 56% higher than the national average. Um, so today we're gonna ask questions, you know, is the United States too dependent on China and other hostile nations for our pharmaceuticals? Is the supply chain resilient and secure? Or are recent concerns driven more by protectionism and a desire for a return to pharmaceutical industrial policy? Uh, I will give a brief bio on my other co-panelists and then we'll get right into it. Uh, I anticipate this to be more conversational and not su super formal. Um, so feel free to jump in and at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Uh, first is Bill Watson. is an Bill's an associate fellow at R Street, where his work focuses on intellectual property and trade law. Bill's a former trade lawyer at the Cato Institute's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies. Bill's also my co-author on the paper we released today. Jackie Varis is an economist and the director of immigration and trade policy at the American Action Forum and soon to be an economist for the Joint Econ Economic Committee in Congress. In May, Jackie wrote a wonderful policy brief ex examining U.S. dependence on Chinese pharmaceuticals. And luckily for us today, she just put out a paper on a proposed Buy American mandate for pharmaceuticals. Finally is Eric Bam. He's a reporter for a reason and in my opinion deserves a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the pharmaceutical supply chain issues right now. Um, <laughs> Eric, you're the reporter. Let's get started with you. Set the stage for us. Why are we all talking about pharmaceutical manufacturing all of a sudden? Is it just the rise of COVID or was this a long time coming? Yeah, thanks, Clark. Um, and thanks for that, uh, that praise. I, I doubt that the Pulitzer Committee is listening, but uh, who knows, maybe <laughs> they are. Uh, this is something that uh, has certainly come to a head with the, the COVID uh, pandemic and with you know concerns about whether the United States would be able to uh, adequately get uh, necessary supplies, you know, pharmaceutical drugs, but also medical supplies kind of writ large, uh, many of which are produced in other countries around the world. But uh, to your point, this is something where the groundwork was already really laid for this uh, panic well before COVID struck. Um, in fact, you know, really, you could, the roots of this are the last few years of U.S. trade policy driven by the Trump administration, which has been uh, a trade policy that's been sort of antagonistic to trade in general, but specifically antagonistic towards trade with China. Um, and we've, we've, we saw late last year, really, the beginnings of uh, this argument that, uh, that some of the, the nationalists are making, some of the protectionists are making, that uh, U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical supply lines are too dependent on China. Uh, a couple of, of great examples of this, there, there were articles that popped up in both Politico and uh, the Atlantic late last year. And I think it's a, a good example, and, and I went through this in one of the pieces I wrote, it's a good example of how the kind of DC echo chamber works on some of these topics. Both of those pieces in reputable, good publications, right? Uh, both of these pieces mentioned this, made this claim that 80% of America's pharmaceutical drugs come from China. In both cases, they linked back to a press release that Senator Chuck Grassley had sent out in August of last year. Uh, the press release in turn, took that claim from a report that the FDA had published. And that report that the FDA had published said that 80% of America's pharmaceutical drugs are imported. And through a series of sort of, you know, a game of telephone or context collapse, whatever you want to call it, uh, that factoid 
went from being 80% of America's pharmaceutical drugs are imported, which is true, to 80% of America's pharmaceutical drugs come from China exclusively, which is not true based on the information that we have. Jackie yeah. has done a great job in terms of the, the research and the actual data, so I'll let her address that uh, in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so the, the groundwork for this is being laid already. And uh, I think interestingly, we can talk about this a little bit later too, but interestingly enough, the sort of main source for that Politico piece at least was a woman who now happens to sit on the board of a uh, Virginia-based pharmaceutical company that just a few weeks ago landed a $350 million grant from the Trump administration to uh, supposedly bring pharmaceutical drug manufacturing back to the United States. Peter Navarro said, this is a great day for America, and this is proof that the Trump trade uh, agenda is, is working and all of that. Uh, so the, that, the sort of groundwork for this has been laid for a while. This is really more about uh, protectionism and, and sort of corporatism than it really is about uh, that it is about healthcare or about uh, concern about our supply chains. And then there's also certainly a political element to this too. It, it's not a secret at all that the Republican Party sees its uh, future, the, this upcoming election and probably subsequent elections as well as being uh, campaigns that they're gonna run very hard against China. They see that as being sort of a, a growth opportunity politically. And so mm -hmm. it's really those two things that are driving, uh, in my opinion, this uh, this fear over over China's supposed control over our over our pharmaceutical supply chains, which is just kind of a manufactured fear. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's turn to what we know about the sources of supply and, and sort of the gaps in the data. Uh, Jackie, you wrote a paper uh, that I mentioned in the, in the introduction uh, back in May. Uh, what do we know? Like, what percentage of our pharmaceutical products are made in the United States? What are made um, you know, abroad and, and we import. And, and then what are, there, there are also some questions about gaps in data that we can get to. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to Bill and you and Bill about that, but, but talk us through what we know about our sources of supply. Sure. I mean, you mentioned the gaps in the data. That is a big factor into determining what is made here and what is made abroad. So you have to start with knowing that that data is just not available anyway. There's no data on US production of pharmaceuticals, medicines, medical supplies. Um, so what I did, I tried to piece together everything I could. So luckily there is a lot of data on trade and imports. And if you look at that import data, here I have some notes. Um, so China supplies about 18% of active pharmaceutical ingredient imports. Those are like the active ingredients on the back of the um, medicine that you get that makes the drug work. And China only supplies 9% of antibiotic imports and less than 1% of total vaccine imports. So based on that data alone, it's impossible for China to make 80% of all the APIs um, that we use in the United States, which was that false claim. Uh, alternatively, if you look at where we do get our imported medicine from, Ireland supplies uh, the most API imports. We get about 30% of our API imports from Ireland. Um, we get a third of our antibiotic imports from Canada, and we get half of our um, vaccine imports from Belgium. Belgium actually supplies half of all the vaccine imports in the world. So that's where vaccines are made. Um, the data also show, if you look at it over time, we've actually come to rely less on China for APIs over time. Uh, so back 10 years ago in 2010, China was our top source for API imports. We got about 25% from them then, and it has since dropped. So that means our supply chains are well diversified. It is working, and that's the way to reduce our reliance on China. And none of this data takes into account U.S. production. Um, so what I could find on U.S. production was based on sales data, and Based on that, about 70% of antibiotics sold in the U.S. were of U.S. origin, and 50% of vaccine spending was for U.S.-made vaccines. So really, I think overall, people overestimate how much we import from China and underestimate how much we make here. Bill, talk to me a little bit about, in our paper, um, for those of you who haven't read it, we talk about some of the gaps in the trade data even. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you see are, are the gaps in the data, and particularly the, the trade data, and, and what the ITC, uh, which is where we get the trade data, the International Trade Commission, uh, what they monitor, and then what the Food and Drug Administration monitors and, and, and can track. 
Yeah, one of the things that's really frustrating about this situation is that there, there has to be uh, a lot of estimating going on. Um, there, there isn't a, a, a clear set number uh, where we know the exact quantity, um, even of APIs coming into the US as APIs. And we certainly don't know the quantity of APIs coming in as components of finished drugs. So uh, when you look at the trade data, um, right, you get, um, and it, it's not even statistical data. This is, this is we have the, the, the quantity in, in dollar terms of imports that have come into the United States uh, and what um, tariff line they fit into, which um, Jackie's research you know, look, looked into that. Um, and uh, so those, those APIs that are coming into the US under a variety of different uh, tariff lines, uh, and um, it, it's hard to look at the big picture and get every single tariff line that covers every single API that doesn't also include other things that you're not actually trying to count. Uh, and so even when you look at it that way, you don't get a, a perfect number, but it still gives us an idea. Um, but then that number gives us an idea of um, actually what U.S. manufacturers of finished drugs where their APIs come from, right? So that number where, where the drugs are coming from, from Ireland, um, those are, are most likely APIs being used by US-based manufacturers finished drugs, which is about 25% uh, of the finished drugs that we consume in the US are manufactured in the US. Um, so um, in order to find out about where drugs that aren't manufactured where the finished drug isn't manufactured in the US, wh where do those APIs come from? Well, we know where the drugs come from. The trade data will tell us where the finished drugs come from. Um, but the API is, is a component in there, right? And it's like, uh, you know, if you buy a, a, a Toyota, maybe it came from Japan, but where did the windshield wipers come from? And where did the stereo come from? Uh, and trade data can't tell you that on, on its own. Um, but, uh, the data that the FDA has been putting out uh, that they've used in congressional testimony, they've talked about in reports, um, they know where um, the facilities are that manufacture uh, these APIs. Because if you're uh, selling a drug in the US market, you, you have to get FDA approval and that FDA approval involves um, divulging your uh, manufacturing uh, practices. Uh, subject to inspection. Um, you have to get approval for, for all of that. And so um, the FDA knows uh, potentially where these drugs are being made. They don't know how much drug is coming from each facility. So their numbers are still not perfect. Um, and um, but the numbers that we do get from them are also not at all illustrative or, or revealing that, that there's this you know, big dependency on China. It turns out most API facilities are in the US uh, or Europe. Uh, and then I think it's what 18% in India and 13% in China. So unless those 13% of facilities are producing six times as much drugs on average uh, as other facilities, uh, we're definitely not getting up to 80 percent. And Bill, just to add to that, I think the, you know, the percentages are obviously important, but just to give people a sense of the scope that we're talking about here, the real numbers, uh, there are two, the more than 2,000 facilities around the world that the FDA has approved. So it's not like we're talking about just a few dozen facilities and there's maybe like one really big one in China or something like that. There's 2,000 of them around the world. Uh, the most recent FDA report that I've seen on this at least said that there's 510 of them are in the United States. And, uh, and that, that, you know, so we're talking about, you know, dozens of facilities in lots of different countries. This is like a very diverse, very complex supply chain. And I think it's, uh, I think it just, uh, the, the perception that you get sometimes when you listen to some people talk about this is that, you know, there's like this really tight supply line that just comes straight from the U.S. to China and everything flows through one pipe. And it's like, that's not the case at all. It's not even really a supply chain. It's more like a worldwide web of, of supply. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll throw this out uh, sort of across the board here, but um, you know, it seems to me that if we're going to make broad policy pronouncements and, and radically try to shift this, it seems to me that we should have a better sense of 
the, the situation on the ground, the, the reality of the situation. And Congress sort of attempted to, to get a, a, a handle on this recently as part of the CARES Act. Um, I know Bill and, and Eric, you guys have both written about this, but, but talk about what the CARES Act it, it sort of tasked the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicines to, to study. I mean, overall, it, it was a question on, you know, how secure is, is the U.S. supply chain? But, you know, what, what will that tell us? What is the time frame on that? And, and what are the sort of concerns? I know, Eric, you've written about some of the concerns that maybe um, this was baked into the cake a little bit. The, the, the outcome may have been baked into the cake a little bit. Yeah, uh, Bill, do you want to take that first or should I go first? Uh, go, no, go ahead. Uh, the, the big component of this, as Clark mentioned, this was part of the, the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, which was the first of the uh, so I guess actually it was the second of the big stimulus bills that passed. There was a smaller one that passed in early March, uh, passed in late March. One section of that law uh, says, this is uh, section 3010 of the law, if you want to go look it up, directs HHS to assess the dependence of the United States on critical drugs and devices that are sourced or manufactured outside of the United States, uh, which is the, the fact-finding part of that that Clark mentioned. And then it sort of reveals the hand a little bit of where Congress wants to go, because later in that same section, it also, uh, Congress also directs uh, the, the same department to include in its final report. And I don't think there's a timeline on this report, but it might be six months. I don't have that in my notes here. Uh, yeah. Asks for this final report to include strategies to encourage domestic manufacturing. So clearly there's already a, a sort of a sense from Congress that we want to get back the report that tells us what we don't know, but we also want that report to tell us how we can do the thing that we've already decided for political reasons we want to pursue which is uh, stimulating domestic uh, manufacturing. And you've already seen this, I mentioned it earlier, the Trump administration has already indicated that it intends to spend a lot of taxpayer money uh, to try and subsidize domestic manufacturing. Uh, whether that's wise or prudent, I, I guess, depends on a lot of different factors, but it seems like it's one of those things that you shouldn't just rush off and do uh, until you have a better understanding of whether it's actually necessary or not. Bill? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a very a Washington sort of thing to do, to, to set out a, a fact-finding uh, yeah. mission uh, with a, um, you know, a, a set outcome, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, whoever ends up working on this report, um, you know, I imagine they'll, they'll take their, their findings that they have, and then they'll you know, sort of massage the correct conclusion out of those findings. Um, so in any event, it will probably be useful um, in that, you know, they will actually get to see some information. They'll take a deep dive into this. Um, but ultimately, it will probably just be used by e either side to, to say what they want to say. Sure. Um, getting back a little bit on, on the China issue, um, you know, it seems to me that the argument is that, well, we're the U.S. would be dependent on an authoritarian regime who's an adversary. Um, and, you know, to, to secure our supply of, of these drugs, um, we need to reshore them or, or bring them, you know, bring the manufacturing out of, out of China. But under the current circumstances, right, under since COVID happened, have we seen China withhold exports? Have we seen other countries withhold exports of, of drugs. I mean, I, I saw, you know, there was some talk in, at the beginning stages of COVID about ventilators being withheld and some personal protective equipment, but have we seen any uh, exports withheld on, on pharmaceuticals? And I'll, I'll broadly, I'll throw that out to, to anybody that wants to. My, my understanding of the situation is that, you know, yeah, early on there were some talks, uh, India, uh, had, had made a, a bunch of noise about um, um, blocking exports um, to, to ensure that they had uh, the right domestic supply. Uh, it was for particular drugs, um, and a lot of that has been worked out. Um, what, what we actually, you know, which I think is the most important point at the end of the day, we haven't seen any actual disruptions. Uh, so there haven't been any situations where uh, patients in the U.S. haven't been able to get the drugs that they needed um, because of a supply disruption. So er early on in, um, I think it was in February, 
uh, before uh, we started having lockdowns in the US, they were going through this in China. Uh, and, and the FDA commissioner um, issued a statement uh, saying that there had been one drug uh, where a, um, th that was reported as being potentially in shortage uh, due to a factory closing in China. Um, but that they weren't really worried about it because there were other manufacturers of that drug and there were other drugs that people could take. And so uh, that wasn't a thing. And, and then they uh, revealed, which I thought was, was particularly interesting that they could figure this out and they knew this, uh, that there were 20 drugs on the US market that had APIs sourced solely from China. Uh, and that none of those were essential. They weren't uh, the particularly important medicines uh, for which there were no um, substitutes. Um, so, so then the potential for a major disruption was, wasn't there, and, and, then it, and then it didn't happen. Uh, and I remember at the time, uh, there were uh, some reports uh, you know, making the case that, okay, it's begun. Here's the first shortage. Uh, and we're going to see, uh, you know, it's going to avalanche from there. And now it's, you know, four months later, and 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 it, it turned that turned out not to be a big deal, yeah. and nothing else has happened. Um, so I, I think, the, you know, unless the concern is that the Chinese government is going to intentionally disrupt the supply chains, uh, we haven't seen any evidence that due to natural causes or or some other um, unintentional situation that the supply chain is particularly fragile. Um, in, fact, in fact, it looks awfully uh, resilient. Yeah, in fact, sure. just this week, one of the deputy directors of the FDA was in front of the Senate Finance Committee and got asked a question about this exact same thing by Senator Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania. And uh, he said that he wasn't aware of any case where a country carried through on any threat, China or any other country carried through on the threat to actually withhold medicines, uh, and that the FDA hadn't seen any sort of shortages as a result of uh, deliberate actions by foreign countries, that any sort of domestic shortages that happened were just because of the initial uh, demand shock that happened when the when the COVID pandemic hit here, and that there were some sort of distribution issues domestically, uh, but it wasn't an import issue at all. Uh, so that's good news. I mean, that is great news. What that means is that most of these fears, again, were largely unfounded. It means that the supply chains work, that they sort of, the resilience of the, uh, of the drug supply chains survived what was probably the biggest test they've faced in modern times. Sure. Um, let's talk about sort of the downsides of, of broad reshoring of the supply chain. Talk to me, um, Jackie and, and Bill, talk to me about, you know, why do we import drugs and finished, finished drugs and APIs? I mean, is there any particular reason why we don't, min you know, why we can't just have them here? Um, and, and sort of talk me through, you know, in some respects, it's a, it's a simple explanation surrounding comparative advantage that, that every trade economist and, and lawyer understands. But walk us through that issue, and I, I can start with Jackie. Sure. Um, so obviously, there are things that the United States can do to encourage domestic production. Um, there are subsidies like the Trump administration is considering, or there's more natural ways to do it. So the deregulation efforts undergoing right now are a great way to make it easier for businesses, manufacturers to make those goods here in the United States. Um, you've heard reports about people who want to manufacture a product or a mask. A lot of this came out right in the beginning, but the approval period was so long that they couldn't do it right away. So really targeting those regulations, um, preventing businesses from quickly being able to respond and removing them and considering leaving them removed post pandemic would be a great thing to do. Sure. Also, there are current tariffs in place on medical goods, medical supplies, um, pharmaceuticals, medicines that are harming our ability to obtain these products. Uh, like you said, any economist or really anyone who understands tariffs will tell you that tariffs increase the cost of goods for the consumer. So either the business importing the product or the final consumer buying it from the business will need to pay an additional tax to obtain that good because it was not made in the United States. Doing that makes those goods more expensive and therefore reduces our ability to increase supply in the United States. So that would be another great thing to do. Um, I've also done some work on Buy American laws, which are also being considered by the Trump administration. Sure. That 
is a mandate from the federal government that in all government procurement activities, so whenever the federal government buys something with a contract, it needs to be majority made in the United States. Those laws already exist, but there are several exceptions. Um, for instance, if a good is not available in the United States, or if it would be unreasonably costly to purchase the U.S. version instead of a um, foreign alternative. Exceptions exist so to protect um, American consumers and the federal government from having to pay too much money and, and not be able to get the product. So what the Trump administration wants to do is remove those exceptions for medical goods and medicines, basically mandating that all medicines and medical goods purchased by the federal government needs to be majority made in the United States. That will completely restrict our options and what we're able to get. It will tie the government's hands and its ability to help um, via procurement activities. And it would be uh, uh, have negative impacts on our recovery, the economy, consumers, everything. Bill? Um, yeah. I, I, if I could say, I, I think it's, it's interesting how you know, if you look at the consequences of, of a Buy American uh, proposal, right, that um, federal purchases of goods, um, of, of, of drugs, um, if you exclude Medicare and Medicaid, uh, is not that big of a portion of the market. Um, so in, in that way, the, the Buy American approach is really a lose-lose, um, where you're not going to create reshoring from a Buy American approach because it's not, it, this is not a big enough part of the market to, to create the incentive to invest in U.S. manufacturing that is otherwise not economical. Um, but you're still going to handicap uh, the VA um, and the Defense Department, um, and, and you're going to make it so that patients who depend on those agencies uh, can't get uh, the same drugs that everybody else can get um, and, and really sort of reduce the quality of care uh, from those government facilities w without actually achieving any industrial policy goals uh, of trying to get uh, manufacturing. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the main reasons why, um, why drugs are made overseas um, where we can't get uh, competition, we can't get uh, production in the United States and why, why companies are seeking that out. Um, I think it's worth um, you know, understanding that, that so much of the pharmaceutical market uh, is, is generic drugs, right? So we're not 90% of, of drugs consumed in the US are generics. Um, um, it, but it's not, you know, the, the, the price difference between generics and, and brand name drugs is, is huge. Um, so that generic drugs are, are largely sold on a, on a commodity pricing uh, model, right? And so going for lower cost manufacturing is, is particularly important um, at actually effectively lowering the price of drugs in the United States. So in, in the broader debate about um, you know, healthcare costs, um, and access uh, to healthcare and to medicine, the, the reshoring agenda is really working very much against uh, other policy goals in the healthcare sphere. Um, and, and so um, unless you're going to make um, manufacturing in the United States um, uh, so, so attractive in terms of subsidies and price supports, um, that cost is going to be passed on uh, e either way. Either the taxpayers are going to are going to bear the cost, um, or patients um, are going to bear the cost. Um, and and it and it's going to be a, a significant increase uh, to the extent that reshoring actually occurs. Sure. I mean, I, I think that that's right. I think that um, you know. There's been a lot of discussion, and I would say there's almost an emerging bipartisan consensus right now on the need to lower prescription drug prices. Um, and, and, you know, the, the Finance Committee, the both sides of the aisle uh, in the Senate Finance Committee have talked about this. I know the House, is, uh, House Democrats have pushed on this. So it seems to me that, yeah, that, that if you push a really aggressive reshoring agenda, it, it rubs up against uh, a broader concern, and, and in my opinion, a more legitimate concern, uh, 
um, about affordability for people on both branded and, and generics. But um, all right, so we touched a little bit on, on the executive order that Peter Navarro is sitting on. Um, we haven't seen any action on that, right? We haven't seen, you know, I, I remember hearing about this back in March that it was coming. Peter Navarro goes on TV all the time and says, you know, it, it's coming. There's been significant pushback uh, from within inside the administration. Um, Jackie, you, you, you wrote about this today, the, the, the costs, and you, you touched on it earlier. Reiterate the costs, and then, I don't know, Eric, if, if you want to talk a little bit about sort of what you're hearing and what you're seeing in terms of pushback and, and where we stand with the, the overall executive order. Sure. Um, so just piggybacking a little bit on what Bill said, he's right. The federal government does not purchase that many drugs, and that's what Buy American applies to. Um, it wouldn't, in my opinion, I'm not an expert, but I'm fairly certain it would not apply to Medicare or Medicaid because the federal government um, just gives money in those instances to pay people back for the drugs that they purchase. They don't directly contract out to buy their own drugs. And the only programs that do do that are TRICARE, um, the VA, and the Indian Health Service. So those are what it would impact. And Again, there's no data that I could find on um, federal procurement of medicine and medical goods, but I looked at federal procurement of goods overall. And if you look at it in that context, compared to total pharmaceutical sales in the United States, it's clear that the federal government buys far less than 1% of the total pharmaceuticals consumed in the United States. So while the impact is negative, and there's a reason that 250 PhD economists signed a letter urging against it, it won't. The impact won't be that large. Eric, talk to me. Talk to us about sort of where this stands, and, and are, are we going to see this? Is it going to be slimmed down? I've, I've, I've heard sort of yeah. conflicting reports. Where where does this stand? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to predict what the Trump administration is going to do on anything when it comes to executive orders. If it follows the pattern that we've seen with so many other things, though, this is what it is, right, is that they, they talk about doing something that sounds really dramatic. Uh, and then it's, well, you know, sometime in the next few weeks, we'll see it. And by the time the order actually comes out, it's usually been uh, slimmed down, reduced, you know, in its, in its size and scope in some way. It's same sort of thing. Uh, that we've seen with uh, his negotiations with NATO and, and some of these other issues. The, the phase one trade deal with China is another great example of it was supposedly a big monster deal. And now it looks like it's, uh, you know, neither side really seems to care too much about it and nobody's hitting the benchmarks. Um, so this has just been, I, I think Jackie hit on this in the, the paper that she published today, uh, is that this is, uh, or I, I guess this is my takeaway from reading the paper that Jackie published today, is that it really fits in line with a lot of the other Trump administration's trade policies, which is that it's not very effective. It doesn't accomplish the thing that they want to accomplish, but that it will cause other negative consequences in its failure to accomplish the thing that they want to accomplish. Uh, Jackie mentions in there that it, it could encourage other countries to retaliate and uh, put up other you know, barriers to it. So, so we may have gotten through the COVID Without, uh, co without countries putting up too many barriers to trade or to exports of medical goods and drugs. But now we may encourage other countries to do that uh, if, if we impose some sort of Buy American order. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, to, you know, why you would do this. And I think, it, you know, the longer it's kind of held up in the White House, the longer the, the people there who understand what they're doing are, are keeping Navarro from getting this out there, that's probably for the best. Yeah, I mean, all the reports I've read is the, the pushbacks coming from the you know, the usual suspects, Steve Mnuchin, uh, Larry Kudlow, and then as well as the more senior economists at, at the FDA. Um, all right, so the Trump administration is talking about a, a big Buy American requirement, but there's also been some movement in Congress and Bill in our paper uh, that came out today. Um, there, you detailed that, you wrote that section, but detailing some of the proposals that have been floated in Congress and in what what are you seeing in, in terms of those bills and, and what do you what's your overall takeaway on on those efforts uh, up on the hill yeah you know it, it's there's there's kind of a um uh sort of a, a jumping on the bandwagon effect going on at the moment where this this is a uh, a, a hot issue uh and so a, a whole lot of bills are being proposed um and uh and you know the the range of, um, of proposals, of reform options, if you could put them on a spectrum of, of, of 
you know, benign to horrible. Um, some of them are actually, I, I think, potentially positive. Um, and um, it, and it's not, it's, it, the, the, the horribleness of the proposal and the likelihood of it actually coming in, into effect are not necessarily correlated, uh, yeah. you know, one way or the other. Um, but I, I, I think you can take this kind of hodgepodge of, of, of proposals that, that are out there um, and, and fit them into a few categories, right? Okay. And um, so maybe the, the, the least bad category um, is, is um, proposals to set up a, a registry or, or to issue reports to do some kind of investigation to learn more about uh, the supply chain. Uh, it, it's kind of an admission that we don't know enough. Uh, le let's find out some more information. Um, and, and, and whether or not that ends up informing policy, um, I, I think it's, it's useful uh, and interesting, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing wh what they come up with. Um, uh, other sort of positive developments that we could get out of this, there's been a, um, a couple of bills proposed to make kind of minor regulatory changes that don't really have anything to do with, um, uh, with uh, manufacturing in China, but could actually help US companies um, that um, uh, you know, are trying to get FDA approval um, and, and, and liberalize that process a little bit in ways that will help, um, help manufacturing in developed countries, um, but, um, but not, not actually be antagonistic in some way. Uh, toward the existing supply chain. Um, and there are certainly proposals, various kinds of proposals to promote domestic manufacturing, right? So uh, tax credits um, uh, is the most popular kind of subsidy, whether it's a, a one-time tax credit for um, uh, building a, a pharmaceutical facility in the United States, expanding production or some kind of ongoing uh, thing. Um, you know, th those kinds of proposals are, are things that are, would normally be really great for every company in every industry. Um, and, and we should, you know, be figuring out ways that we can change uh, the, the U.S. Uh, tax system to promote investment in, in U.S. manufacturing and U.S. Like, other kinds of activity in the United States. So those, those are not, um, not really troubling. On the, on the more protectionist end, um, we've seen maybe the maybe the least protectionist approach that we've seen is to, is to require country of origin labels on prescription pill bottles. So that when you, when you pick up your, your prescription, it'll say made in China. Um, I don't know, maybe it'll say made in the United States with Chinese, uh, you know, raw materials or something like that. Uh, it depends on how they, how they, uh, how, how they uh, actually formulate regulations to do that. Um, but, I, I think that's probably, if that were enacted, would be minimally disruptive because companies already know where all this stuff comes from. Uh, having to put it on a bottle um, could could be a problem if they had to change how their supply chains work to deal with that. Uh, but if not, then it just kind of gives in more information to consumers. And, and I think that um, you know advocates of um, uh, of domestic manufacturing and the, the economic nationalist movement. Uh, I think sometimes they overestimate how much Americans actually care about where uh, things come from. Uh, when, you, when you poll people, uh, you, you'll find a, a strong number of people that, that want things to be made in the United States, uh, but then when they have to actually spend more money to get those things, uh, the amount of money they're actually willing to spend is a lot lower. Uh, so uh, considering how much, how sensitive people are to how expensive their drugs are, uh, I, I'm not sure that would actually accomplish much. Um, the, um, so we, and we talked about Buy American. So um, some of the proposals in Congress are, are looking to legislate changes to the Buy American process to, to, to deal specifically with pharmaceuticals. Um, some of those proposals have been advertised by um, members of Congress in a very vague way to make it sound like they're gonna ban all imports from China. Um, and, uh, and, and they don't actually go that far. Uh, so I have yet to see a bill proposed that actually would prohibit um, a, 
you know, private insurance companies from paying for, um, <clears throat> for, for drugs ma made anywhere. Uh, there has been a bill proposed uh, to impose tariffs on, uh, on, on drugs from uh, China and India um, and drugs from elsewhere with APIs from China and India. Uh, I, I think that's kind of a DOA. Um, the, that, that, I mean, it's just very clearly a, a WTO violation. Right. Um, and, and, and it would make drugs more I don't think people have, have the yeah. interest in that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, uh, that's uh, a dream scenario for the K Street uh, lobbying and, and legal firms uh, just wait, you know, sort of itching to, to get their claws in, in some of that. Um, all right, so th th that's a broad overview. Um, uh, and a lot of this, um, you know, it ranges, right, from fairly benign to more aggressive uh, protectionism. So let's talk through some sort of non-protectionist policy solutions that we might consider, right? Um, let me let me say as a, as a preliminary matter, I may exercise some uh, moderator's prerogative here, but, um, you know, it seems to me that the answer to trade and investment problems with China and supply chains issues that we have with China, and not just limited to pharmaceuticals, is not autarky or domestic industrial policy. It's actually pretty simple. It's it's more free trade agreements, um, including in the Asia Pacific region, um, and it's it's the United States not embracing uh, the sort of industrial policies that we complain about in China, um, and so. I guess I'll, I'll go back to Bill if, if you want to lay out some of the ideas that we articulated in our paper, or I, I can do that. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll defer to you on you know what what are some steps that the U.S. could take to, in essence, lessen a dependence on China, or even if it's not a, a very serious dependence, if the politics of this situation force us to do something so that we are no longer dependent or, or dealing with China on pharmaceuticals, what can the United States do in that space that, that's uh, more proactive and more healthy as opposed to sort of sclerotic protectionism? Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll get started and then I, I, Clark, you feel free to, to add in as much as you want. Um, sure. I, uh, I, you know, this is, this is no secret, but you know, one of the, one of the, the most frustrating parts about the, Trump trade agenda is how there are there are non-belligerent options uh, for for solving the problems that uh, that that uh, some of some of which are legitimate that that people are concerned about, um, and so one of those, of course, is is almost anything having to do with China, um, and, and there's really uh, sort of an uh, an obvious opportunity for U.S. leadership. In addressing problems that um, that are, are global, uh, in, in where there's a global benefit uh, and and a, and a narrow um, sort of a narrow target, uh, you know, which is some policy uh, by one country or just a few countries, um, and and there's really room to to negotiate, uh, come up with agreements, uh, and find common ground on those things, like people have been doing for. The last 50 years, um, and, and so one of those possibilities uh, is is to take on the the problem of export restraints, um, export uh, restrictions in a crisis. Um, if if we can get countries to agree that in certain situations we will not be impose, we all agree not to impose export restrictions, um, uh, to to find. Um, uh, sort of best practices to deal with these situations. Um, I, there, there's plenty to talk about uh, and, and to get some reassurances where everyone can agree that, look, here are the new rules of the road. We all know what everyone else is going to do. Uh, and, and that can reduce a lot of anxiety. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, uh, in, a, in a different administration with a different mentality in, in Washington, that, that's certainly a, you know, a, a best first option. Uh, for dealing with this. Sure. Can I just and throw in a quick question for Bill, because I'm curious about this, that I've heard some, I think I, I may have even talked to Clark about this at some point, but uh, that if you want to have less, uh, you, know, you want to be less dependent on China, 
one way to go about doing that rather than raising tariffs on China would be to lower tariffs on China's competitors, right? Like identify the countries that are making the products that you that you want to import more of, but you don't want to get them from China and make it easier to import from those places. Does that make does that make as much sense as it seems like it does? Uh, it, yeah, I, I mean, I like the idea of um, of you know um, sort of confrontational liberation, uh, liberalization, right? Yeah. Uh, where where we're gonna we're gonna That's liberalize different. trade um, uh, with with other people, you know, to sock it to somebody else, um, you know, and and preferential trade agreements have always been um, a, a source of, of trade diversion, right? Which is normally considered a bad thing. Right. Um, but, it, but if your goal is trade diversion, then absolutely something like the TPP, right? Where, where you take countries in the Asia Pacific region, uh, not China, uh, and, and liberalize trade and come up with rules and, and, and set up a, a, a system that is uh, supportive of uh, the US economic agenda in the area uh, that promotes uh, positive liberal values uh, that we would like to see China adopt. Um, that, that's a great that's a great uh, way to approach this issue. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see if that ever happens. Yeah, I mean, look, that we we joke a lot of us on, on Twitter about this all the time, but it seems to me that you know, if you want to sort of fence in China, um, there was a deal on the table. It was imperfect, but it was the deal on the table at the time. Uh, and it would have bolstered U.S. supply chains throughout the region and strengthened the U.S. commercial position, um, you know. And and unfortunately, we we shot ourselves in the foot with that, right? By by withdrawing from the TPP. Um, you know, I, I'd add that that the United States could could do if if, if we can't get a big multilateral round at the, at the WTO, uh, banning export restrictions on pharmaceuticals. U.S. could could put together a within the WTO uh, confines could. You're, you're free to negotiate what are known as plurilateral agreements, which are agreements with some, but not all WTO members. And the United States could put together um, a, a group of sort of allies, right? A, a coalition of the willing. Um, and our paper suggests the United Kingdom, the EU, Switzerland, Mexico, Canada, Taiwan, Australia, Japan, Israel, and India as countries that would probably be interested in negotiating um, on this. But, and again, you know, if, if the WTO proves fruitless, then, then the U.S. has other options, right? We have TPP. We could, we could go back and amend existing trade agreements we have in a, on a very narrow basis. I, I know that that tends to open a can of worms where you go in and say, okay, we're going to ne renegotiate on this one provision. And then that, you know, once you open that up, are we opening up negotiations with, you know, the U.S. has 20 different partner countries on an FTAs. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but but it seems to me that all of those are healthier uh, than than engaging in in protectionism. Um, what are there are though responsible steps that the United States could take um, to encourage domestic manufacturing? Right, uh, Jackie, talk a little bit about sort of uh, the, the deregulation process, maybe stockpiling. Um, what what are some other options that we can use to su secure supply? Yeah, I mean, a lot of great people have done great work on this. Um, like I said, the best way to encourage domestic manufacturing is to get rid of the barriers to domestic manufacturing, which we already have in place, right? You wouldn't think that we would want to make it hard to manufacture here in America, but in a lot of cases it is. So the deregulation efforts, um, kind of streamlining the approval process. Sure. And stockpiling is a very good idea. Um, especially for future pandemics that we don't, no one saw COVID coming, right? So you can't predict the future. I will also just, since you were just talking about it, hop on the TPP train because, I mean, I doubt the United States would ever uh, rejoin TPP under the Trump administration. Um, but the whole purpose of TPP in the first place was strategic. It was so we could counterbalance China in the Asia Pacific region. Um, it, it was entirely for this purpose to diversify our supply chains away from China. So I know I've heard talk of the Trump administration maybe looking for bilateral or multilateral agreements to kind of do the same thing. Um, the Trump administration has 
negotiated multiple tweaks to our current bilateral trade agreements because they're all about bilateral instead of multilateral. So they, they've made updates to the Korea FTA, the Japan FTA. Um, so I could see stuff like that happening, but definitely focusing on removing barriers to manufacturing at home is just as important. Right. Um, looks like we've gotten some questions. Um, I will read those. Um, and I'll kind of allow everybody to weigh in. Um, let's see here. Um, Eric, why can't both be true? Protectionism and undue dependence on Chinese foreign sources. Um, Jackie, also Jackie, how confident are you that pharmaceutical imports from Ireland and Belgium are themselves not dependent on Chinese imports? That is, if China decided to cut off pharma component exports to Belgium and Ireland, how, what would that impact uh, be on the United States? I guess I'll go first. I mean, I think it is a mix of things, right? I said that at the beginning, that I think this is kind of a combination of economic and political issues. And the political issues are then sort of divided between domestic political issues and like geopolitics writ large, right? So a lot of this is mixed up in the, the US's uh, increasingly confrontational stance towards China. Um, I, so I think I think on one hand there's there's a lot of uh, of protectionism at play and just sort of typical crony capitalism at play and some like there's a there's a part of me that strongly thinks that this whole neo nationalism thing is really just an economic development scheme it's really just about implementing industrial policy that will subsidize U S companies and that that's really the end goal here and China is just the bad guy that we can use uh, to get leverage to do all those things um, so uh, th there's that. Uh, to the extent that we're overly dependent on China, though, I mean, I would give that back to Jackie. I mean, I think the data suggests that we're not. I think we should be humble about acknowledging what the data says and what it doesn't say. And I think whenever you see uh, a Josh Hawley or, or somebody else in that sphere uh, claiming that they know things that we just don't know, like follow the sources back and see what they're actually claiming. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, we should try to find the information that we don't have. We should have the FDA, you know, put together uh, that that information, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think some humility about that is important, and I think the rush to uh, subsidize domestic companies uh, really kind of gives away the game here. I absolutely agree. And um, to answer that question, you know, that is a valid critique, right? We don't know the full extent of how global supply chains work and what portion of, let's say, imports from Ireland have components from China. Yeah. What I'll say is that I think if this pandemic has shown us anything with regard to medicine, it's that our well-diversified supply chains have protected us. Um, you know, y'all mentioned that we haven't faced shortages of medicine. You know, I know Scott Lincecum did great work showing that as well. And the reason is that we are not overly dependent on any one nation. And also, like I said, we underestimate how much is made in the United States. So I'm currently working on a project to try to piece it together the best I can. Um, that data, uh, it's hard, <laughs> but I'm trying my best. And um, I'm confident, though, that more than half of all medicine, more than half of medical supplies are made in the United States. So I think it's important not only to be thankful for global diversified supply chains that protect us in this case, but also be cognizant of domestic manufacturing capabilities. And I think just to add to that, there's, there's a risk that uh, trying to pull all the supply chains back in the United States actually puts us at greater risk, right? Like what if the next pandemic starts here and shuts down all the factories here and we've lost the ability to, uh, to get supplies, get medical supplies or drugs from somewhere else? Or what if there's some other natural disaster that befalls? You know, I mean, anytime you have all of your manufacturing in one place, whether it's here or China or anywhere, uh, that would be a problem. It's far better to have a diverse uh, network like we do. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I think that's an underestimated point. I think that, that too often the hawks in the United States basically say, well, you, you bring the manufacturing back and it'll be safe and secure. But, you know, we have local disruptions all the time. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, I will pivot here to a question from Doug Palmer, a Politico reporter. Um, he asked, do you, did we look at supplies needed for mass production of vaccines for the coronavirus? And do you 
do you anticipate any bottlenecks? And I'll throw that out uh, sort of as a broad question. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I could it just as a, uh, not necessarily a, a direct answer to that question, but I, I, I think it, it's interesting that there are, there are sort of two issues going on with uh, supply chain resiliency, right? And, and one of those is that, um, how does the supply chain respond when there is a disruption to supply, uh, when factories get shut down? And, and that's a, a different question than how does the supply chain respond to a demand spike, um, where all of a sudden you need, um, you know, millions of masks uh, and ventilators, and, and you know, those those are the areas where we we've, we've seen problems in the supply chain because there's a sudden unexpected spike in demand that cannot actually physically be produced very quickly. Um, and, and how can you um, how can you organize a supply chain in a way that's flexible enough to respond to some kind of unforeseen new demand. Um, so uh, um, in the pharmaceutical uh, sphere, uh, it's the um, hydroxychloroquine, right? Um, where there was a sudden, a, sudden, um, uh, a sudden spike in demand for this drug uh, and, and that was disruptive. Um, it, it's interesting to me that I, I don't know how reshoring would would help that. Um, there, there seems to be a disconnect uh, there between, you know, would domestic manufacturing somehow make uh, the industry better able to respond to that? I, I, I don't see that, uh, that argument. I, I, I understand where people are coming from with saying long supply lines uh, are, are, are potentially disrupted by something happening overseas. Uh, and so, so we could shorten that. Um, and, and it turns out that's, that's not really how it works. But, but I, I don't even know what the argument is for reshoring in terms of, of being more able to respond to demand, um, essentially by having fewer options from where, for where you can get your supplies. I, I don't know where, where that link is. And um, just to add to that, <laughs> to address the original question, the short answer is no, I didn't look at that. Um, I wouldn't even know where to begin <laughs> because I don't have that, uh, healthcare drug expertise that would be needed. Um, people in industry would probably know better, but based on all of the gaps in the data I came across, I imagine it would be an incredibly difficult thing to try to figure out. Um, so that could be something that we rely on these government reports to tell us. It could be something we just have to piece together, but I don't think it changes uh, the main fact that diversifying supply chains is a form of defense. Great. Uh, last last question. Um, a lot of this in the question is uh, a lot of the conversation has focused on APIs and small molecule drugs. Do we have data on biologics and more innovative drugs? Um, I, I'll turn that over to Bill and, and Jackie. I mean, anybody who, who has paid attention to that, Bill and I have written a lot about uh, biologics and, and the nexus with trade policy. But, but Bill, um, I guess I'll start with you. Do you have any sense on, on where, we're, where we get the data on, on biologics and, like, a, like you said, more innovative drugs? Well, I, the, sh the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> that, that would be an interesting thing to, to look into, you know, more specifically. Um, I know uh, Jackie had looked at vaccines, um, you know, which is, a, um, which is part of that, that issue. Um, I, I would be surprised uh, if the uh, biologic supply chains were as um, as diverse uh, and as um, extensive and and as um, if there were quite as much overseas presence actually in the biologic supply chains, um, particularly outside of maybe the United States and Europe. Um, yeah. But mostly because that's this is a very a very high tech area. Um, it, it's not it's not something where you have giant chemical plants producing you know millions of tons of uh, of, of some you know generic compound. Um, it, it, it's it's a very different manufacturing process. Yeah, and it's I mean it's expensive and it takes a lot of IP and uh, sort of on the front end to to like like the questioner, you know, like the question said that it, it tend to be more innovative and so it's less conducive to sort of mass production. Um, 
looks like we're out of time. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions that were asked, but um, really appreciate it and keep paying attention to this debate. It looks like it's still live. So uh, thanks again. Take care.